Systolic blood pressure is the top number when you measure blood pressure. It represents the pressure of the blood in the vessels when your heart contracts. And the bottom number, or diastolic blood pressure, represents the pressure in the blood when the heart's in its relaxed mode. Each of these numbers are sensitive indicators of all-cause mortality, death from any cause. The higher blood pressure, the higher your risk of premature death and disability. High blood pressure and the conditions related to high blood pressure are the leading cause of death and disability. 287,000 people die from congestive heart failure. 790,000 or more are going to have strokes. And these conditions are primarily caused and associated with high blood pressure. Most people in our culture will develop high blood pressure if they live long enough to reach retirement age, which means if you are retiring and you're not hypertensive, you are abnormal. It's normal to be sick with hypertension. You do not want to be normal. You want to be healthy. High blood pressure represents 38 million visits to physicians. It's worth tens of billions of dollars to the medical profession. Drug intervention, unfortunately, is largely disappointing, with the improved outcomes really only coming for the people with the very highest levels of blood pressure. But the majority of people that actually have heart attacks and strokes caused by high blood pressure don't have blood pressure high enough to justify medication because the medications themselves have risks. That's why they won't give you medication until your blood pressure reaches a certain level, because more people will die from the drugs than from the moderately elevated high blood pressure. However, that doesn't mean moderate elevated high blood pressure is not a problem. If you have a blood pressure of 138 over 88, you have five times the risk of having a heart attack compared to somebody at 110 over 70. And for every point your systolic blood pressure is reduced with diet and lifestyle change, there's a 1% reduced risk of all-cause mortality. And that re risk reduction goes down to 90 over 60. So even if your blood pressure is 120 and you make diet and lifestyle changes and reduce your blood pressure to 90, you've reduced your risk of all-cause mortality 30%. So what works at lowering blood pressure? We know that weight loss does. We know that a vegetarian high-fiber diet does, independent of weight loss. We know that not drinking alcohol does. We know that exercise helps. Now, drugs do reduce blood pressure, and they do reduce the risk of stroke at the highest levels of hypertension, enough to justify their application for people that are not, are, are not willing to get well. But that's not without a, a price. Medications, common side effects of blood pressure medications include chronic cough, fatigue, impotence, and premature death. Sodium restriction, if you aggressively reduce sodium to half a milligram of sodium per calorie, you'll get a blood pressure reduction effect often that will exceed any combination of medications. John McDougall at the St. Helena Hospital was able to demonstrate a 17-point drop, one of the highest effects that's ever been shown in reducing blood pressure through combining diet and lifestyle changes consistent with the McDougall plan. And this is a study that was done by T. Colin Campbell from Cornell University and us at the True North Health Center, where we had an average drop of 37 points using therapeutic fasting, where we put people on water only for a period that ranged from 5 to 23 days in this study. Their average drop of 174 consecutive patients was 37 points. And if we look at just people with the highest levels of hypertension, where you can justify medication, that is people uh, with blood pressures that start off at an average of 180 and go up to 240, those patients drop their blood pressure an average of 60 points. Now that's 60 points plus whatever effect their medication was having, because they all started uh, medicated ended up unmedicated. So whatever the 60 points plus whatever effect the medication was having is the largest effect that's ever been shown in the scientific literature in treating high blood pressure in humans. That study um, was published in JMPT 2001. Um, we later published a second paper that looked at borderline hypertension, and as you'd expect, people with more moderate levels of hypertension had proportionally smaller reductions, but normalization of blood pressure it works the same in basically everybody. If you have high blood pressure that's essential hypertension, you go on a fast, your blood pressure is going to normalize. If you're willing to go do dangerous and radical things like eat good and exercise and go to bed, you can maintain it. And that's the rule. Um, once we published these papers, we got some attention. Uh, at first, was the International Union of Operating Engineers, a big California labor union. These guys are the ones that build your highways and run all the heavy equipment. They're not always the most health conscious or health educated individuals, but nonetheless, they asked uh, Dr. Lyle and I are to go and do a presentation on our results, and because they were considering making fasting a benefit to the members in their union. We knew, of course, that wasn't going to really happen, but we thought it'd be entertaining, so we went down, we presented our material to their representatives, and they had a bunch of people there. They had a, 
uh, representative of uh, the operating engineers. They had the guys that hire the union guys. They had a guy from the National Institute of Health that did uh, statistical analysis and uh, health risk assessment. They had an actuary there that calculates the money business, you know. And um, so after we did our presentation, there were the normal objections. The people that hired the union guys were objecting to adding any kind of additional benefits because they already spent a lot of money in healthcare, and they didn't think that having to pay to send people on vacation made a lot of sense. Uh, I had described to that gentleman that brought up that objection what actually happens during fasting, and pretty soon he decided maybe it wasn't a vacation. But nonetheless, he still didn't think it was worthwhile. The NIH reviewer said that he thought it would be cost effective, that if they did it, it would actually save money because they spent so much money treating hypertension. Uh, the funniest thing, though, was the actuary, this little guy, and he'd been running numbers in the back of the room, and he uh, said, Dr. Goldhammer, I've been doing some calculations here and here, and if we did this program, don't you think it would make them live longer and therefore increase their retirement benefit payouts? <laughs> I didn't know what to say. <laughs> Fortunately, I didn't have to say anything because one of the guys stood up and I knew immediately he was a crane operator because his neck was like twice the size of my thigh. And he said, listen, little man, you should remember who you work for. He said, you work for us. Why don't you calculate how much money we're gonna save when I come back there and break your neck? <laughs> and then amazingly, they voted unanimously to make our program a fully covered medical benefit for any member of the union or their family that had high blood pressure or diabetes, and they asked us to do a study. They said they wanted to know whether it was gonna be cost effective for them. So we took the first 30 consecutive members of the union that they sent us, we put them through an average of three weeks stay, which was uh, two weeks of fasting, a week of follow up, more or less. They lost an average 26 pounds during their stay. They dropped their blood pressure 30 over 11, eliminating the need for medication. And on one year follow-up, they were down 28 pounds and had maintained much of the results on the blood pressure. When they did the cost analysis, they found they saved more money in the first year than the entire cost of the program. They extended the program that went on for over a decade. So that was very gratifying. Um, what was interesting was the very first gentleman they sent us when the program was approved, they sent us a guy within a couple of days, and this was a crane operator, grossly overweight, high blood pressure, 240 over 120, diabetes, had never eaten a vegetable in his life. He lived on these. Well, he didn't exactly live on this. I couldn't get a picture that was exactly what he liked. What he would do is he would take this, lift the bun up, and take that disgusting piece of lettuce off and discard it, and then have his meal. So. He was not what you would call a raw food vegan. <laughs> so he shows up at our center and he says, what am I doing here? Because they didn't tell him what the program was. <laughs> they just said, you can't drive the crane anymore. You're gonna kill yourself or others. You have to normalize your blood pressure. And if you do, you can go back to work. In the meantime, go to this place and they'll fix you up. <laughs> so he walks in and you know, he says, this is the wrong place. I said, no, 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 you're in the right place. And he says, well, what am I doing here? I said, you're here because you're sick. He says, I'm not sick. I'm just fine. I said, you're not fine. You have high blood pressure, you have diabetes, you're carrying a keg around in your belly and you're gonna die. And he says, well, don't we all have to die? I said, well, yeah. So I take a different tack. I said, yeah, but you're on $880 a month worth of medications and if we get you healthy, you probably won't need those. And he says, what do I care that the union pays for my drugs? And then I realized this wasn't my normal, highly compliant, motivated individual that I'm used to treating. And I wasn't sure what to do. And I was thinking about his medical history, and you know, what, what happens to diabetic hypertensive males that are on a lot of high blood pressure medications? Yeah, so I said, you know, if we get you off all those drugs, there's a chance we can do something about your little problem. He starts to stand up, and I'm thinking, that wasn't such a good idea, and I'm thinking, uh-oh, because <laughs> he's a big guy, you know? But he just says, well, why the hell didn't you just say so? <laughs> so, okay, so far, so good, we're checking him in. Now, I'm thinking, I gotta try to feed him something before I start fasting, because he's got nothing but them in his colon, they're gonna be a problem. So we sit him down and give him some food, like you've been eating here. And, uh, you know, he's making an effort to eat the food, but I'm thinking, oh my gosh, we must have missed the tumor he has in his throat, because he's like <coughs> 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 And I sat down and I said, uh, 
excuse me, but it looks like you're having a little trouble with the food. He said, what food? He said, this is disgusting. He says, if I have to eat tasteless swill like this, I'd rather just die. He says, why don't you go out to my truck? There's a shotgun there. You bring it in when I'm not looking, you can just shoot me in the head. So we checked him in. 26 days of water only fasting later, he had normal blood pressure. He lost a lot of weight. And we're bringing him off the fast. We set him down to eat the food. Only now he's actually eating the food. And when I sat down, I said, it looks like you're doing a little better with the food now. He says, yeah, your damn chef's finally getting the hang of it. <laughs> it. Took me 20 minutes to convince him it was the same food. He said, no, that stuff you gave me when I came in was disgusting. He says, this stuff here, it's, it's not bad. So we had a little entertainment. After we signed the union contract, it appears that the California Board of Medical Quality Assurance became concerned. And so they sent in an investigator to investigate our operation. Up to that point, they'd ignored us. Um, he, a uh, large gentleman. Do you know how people that drink too much get this hyperemic look? You know, that real red kind of look. So I'm not saying he was a drinker, but... <clears throat> He couldn't really walk from the parking lot even to the room without losing his breath, you know. He wasn't in optimum health, let's put it that way. And I could tell he was a little upset because, you know, before he even got into the building, he was saying that he was very uncomfortable. And I was saying, I can see you're very uncomfortable. And uh, he said, where did you get the idea that it was okay to do this fasting business? And I said, well, I don't know, I read a book. And these four guys, you know, Moses, David, Elijah... <laughs> Jesus. He says, well, that's irrelevant. So we were talking for a while. It was pretty clear he had his mind made up about us. And so I suggested that perhaps he would like to check in, that we could treat him for 30 or 40 days on fasting. And when we're done, he wouldn't be such a fat, miserable human being. Unfortunately, just as I was saying that part, our psychologist, Dr. Lyle, walked in the room. Just as I was saying that, and he didn't look very happy took me outside. He told me that I was failing to establish rapport and that I was being socially inappropriate. <laughs> he finished the conversation and about a week later the sheriffs came with the subpoenas and they, we went through the whole process and they had determined that recommending fasting constituted such a gross violation of the standard of medical practice that it rose to the level of criminal negligence. So I had to hire a criminal defense attorney to represent myself against potential charges from the uh, Attorney General, which represents the medical board, and I was the first person in my family that ever needed the services of a criminal defense attorney. My mother was so proud. <laughs> I wasn't too worried, though, because I was told by my... I had two patients that were guards at San Quentin, and they said that there's no chiropractors currently incarcerated. And I could work in the infirmary, it'd be fine. You know? and I started thinking, you know, if we, we could call it a hunger strike, and we could look at recidivism rates in prisoners that underwent fasting and dietary change than people. But anyway, it turns out they decided that recommending fasting didn't actually constitute criminal negligence because fasting is used by every hospital in this country. If you have acute pancreatitis, that's exactly what they do. There was even a provision in Medicare at that time that paid for fasting, but only if, it needed, if you had rapid weight loss necessary for urgent surgery. So that meant if you fasted and got well, it wasn't covered. But anyway. The, they backed away, it worked out fine. And as a consequence, we've, we went ahead with our approach of using fasting. Now, currently, fortunately, there's a lot of popular press and a lot of information in the scientific literature about fasting. Some of it's about calorie restriction, some of it's about intermittent fasting, where people reduce calories to say five, five or 600 calories once or twice a week, about reducing the feeding window. It really should be called intermittent feeding, but they call it intermittent fasting. That's not what I'm here to talk about today. Those things are very interesting. For those of you that are interested in those as methods to help with weight loss and whatnot, you can go on to our website, healthpromoting.com. My wife, Dr. Morano, has written a good article on that. Very interesting stuff, can be very helpful. But what we're here to talk about today is complete, total, water-only fasting. Water-only fasting is uh, the complete abstinence of all substances except water in an environment of complete rest. And it's different than starvation. 
Even though sometimes you'll see fasting and starvation used interchangeably, they're completely different processes. Fasting is when you're, you have labile reserves and you're living on those reserves. If you deplete those reserves, you enter another process called starvation, and then you die. And so we don't do that because it would really be bad for our outcome data. <laughs> and we've had 15,000 people in the last 31 years that have come in, and everybody that's come in has, has walked out with, in relation to fasting. So, so far we have a good safety record. In fact, we have an article that we're hoping to be uh, seen published uh, uh, this next month that is what's called a fasting safety study where we look at 1,126 consecutive patients over five years and we track out all of their uh, issues. And uh, it definitely is a safe and effective experience when it's done properly. Interestingly enough, the average um, 70 kilogram male, which is an average today, but a 154 pound male would on average have 18% body fat and using the calculations uh, of uh, one calorie per kilogram per hour, that person could fast on average about 70 days. So we don't do fasting of that duration, we rarely go over 40, but the point is the reserves, even in a thin person, are much greater than what people would otherwise imagine. However, even moderate activity doubles calorie and proportional protein utilization. So one of the important things in water-only fasting is that this be done in a supervised setting in, in a contained environment with rest. Uh, if you're trying to maximize fat utilization, minimize protein utilization.